Also, als äh, guter Europäer, ich will dieses Seminar in deutscher Sprache geben. <lacht> Aber ich will nicht die schöne Sprache von Schiller und Goethe und Gauss und Einstein zu ermorden. <lacht> so I will continue in English, but I will use a German title. The title I gave, I gave a long time ago, that's in the program, and I'm going to speak about something slightly different. I'm going to give our account of our experience with open source genomics of the German E. coli outbreak. I'm going to record this, I'm recording the slides, so you'll be able to see it on YouTube later. Okay, so just for a general audience, let's talk about E. coli, just to remind you, this is a very versatile bacterium, biology's premier model organism, more known about this organism than any other. Um, Facebook friend of mine, I've never met him in real life, Carl Zimmer, actually has written a very good book summarizing E. coli's place in biology called Microcosm. It's a gut commensal for all sorts of mammals, kangaroos to cattle, biotechnology workhorse, so diabetics rely on insulin made in E. coli nowadays, and it's also uh, a probiotic and used uh, in that uh, in that way to prevent infections. And there's a couple of quotes there which I won't read out which uh, just highlight the centrality of E. coli in biology. Unfortunately, it's also a versatile pathogen. It infects many hosts and different organ systems. Uh, and you can see them listed there, piglets, weaning diarrhea. I learned at this conference that in cattle it causes bovine mastitis. In birds, uh, it can cause cone bacillosis. Uh, and in humans, a whole variety of infections, gut, urinary tract infections, bloodstream infections, meningitis, and even among the, the gut infections, there is a huge variety of different pathotypes of E. coli um, that cause diarrhea, and they're all listed there. And it's worth remembering that Shigella, all the varieties of Shigella, are now actually considered varieties of E. coli. Hemolytic uremic syndrome is probably one of the worst complications of E. coli infection. Uh, sugar toxin producing E. coli give rise to this syndrome. They cause bloody diarrhea, but they also cause damage to the kidneys and to the brain, they cause anemia and loss of platelets uh, through the action of this toxin here, which you can see has two components uh, on the left there, the active part of the enzyme and then this elaborate uh, binding component of the enzyme that allows it to bind to cells. Now, just to move away from E. coli and move to Birmingham, uh, where I work in Birmingham, we are pretty geeky, I have to say. You can see we blog, and my bioinformatician here blogged back in 2009 uh, on the arrival of our first uh, next generation sequencer, 454. Uh, you can see you know, typical geekiness there. He was waiting like a kid for, for Santa, like a kid waiting for Santa Claus, waiting for this uh, instrument to arrive. And he even took photographs of it coming uh, in the crate and being taken out of the crate. Here's my one of my colleagues, Charles Penn, looking a bit like a lemon standing next to it. Uh, but we've been doing this for a couple of years now, we, and we've been blogging, and we, we enjoy this, and we get into this kind of stuff a lot. Uh, earlier this year, I blogged on this remarkable uh, event, which is that I won an iron torrent in a competition. So uh, iron torrent wanted to introduce the technology to Europe, and they put out a competition. There are 150 entries, and I was one of two that won. So... This was a very interesting development. We knew that we were going to get this technology, so we started gearing up to understand what the technology was about and how we were going to use it. Uh, iron torrents would be mentioned, millions of wells reading sequences. It's a microchip that detects the release of protons during the sequencing reaction around a three-hour runtime. It costs in the hundreds of pounds. Uh, depends whether you take all of the reagent costs in and, and what chip you're looking at, but very cheap. Now, to switch back to E. coli, uh, German E. coli outbreak has already been mentioned, uh, very extensive, 4,000 deaths or more, uh, 4,000 cases and over 40 deaths, and links to sprouting seeds, higher risk of hemolytic uremic syndrome than we usually expect in these kind of outbreaks, and for some reason, females particularly at risk. I'm not, I've not come across any uh, good evidence as to why that should be so. Uh, I suspect it's because real men don't eat salad. Uh, and that might be the reason, but if there's anyone got a better idea, then let's have it, hear about it maybe later. Um, here's the time scale of the outbreak, so it peaked uh, towards the end of May, 
uh, but stuttered on for quite a few weeks after that. And so let's focus now on this guy here, Herr Dr. Holger Rode uh, in Hamburg. He's a microbiologist. He's at the center of the outbreak, dealing with all the patients and all the horrific problems associated with dealing with all these patients, including worried well uh, and, and the sick patients. Um, and he was thinking, what was he going to do with this isolate, with the outbreak strain, and, and to investigate it further? Now, if you come from the English-speaking world, you know one thing that you should do in this situation, and that is you call on, on an organization called International Rescue. Now, I suspect that Thunderbirds is not well known in Germany, but uh, it, all, every school child knows in, in, in England that what you do, you call International Rescue, and these wonderful rockets come and, and save you. This organization based on an island called Tracy Island, they come and save you. So he called International Rescue, and something very dramatic happened. It wasn't quite like Thunderbirds are go, but what happened was that one of his Chinese uh, associates said, why don't you send it to BGI and get it genome sequenced there? And so that's what happened. Off it went to BGI in Shenzhen. Didn't go in Thunderbird 2, went by a regular aeroplane, but it went to BGI Shenzhen, who just happened to have taken receipt of uh, an iron torrent uh, PGM themselves or, or on trial, um, and they were delighted to actually sequence the genome of the isolate. But they also did something that was quite remarkable and perhaps unexpected. As soon as they'd sequenced the, uh, the genome, they released the data into the public domain, and they released it under a Creative Commons Zero uh, license, which means that it could be used by anyone, and they asserted no rights on it whatsoever. I've actually been probing over the last couple of days to say, did you really mean that? What would you have done if someone had published a genome paper without acknowledging you at all? And they said, well, they might have got a bit cross, but that would have been covered by other things. But anyway, these three guys here I've listed, these are the ones that were uh, instrumental in actually getting this, uh, this, these sequences released under this Creative Commons license, which meant that other people could use them. Now, it just so happens, to continue the international theme, that uh, my bioinformatician Nick Lohman uh, was looking at this, and he was actually at a uh, conference. He had been playing around with some iron torrent data that we had uh, on E. coli that had been released already on E. coli K12. And so he was just poised to take hold of that data and assemble it uh, and, um, and start to make some sense of it. So he did that, but he not only just did that, he also, uh, at the conference and using his blog and Twitter, called on other bioinformaticians to get involved and said, let's crowdsource the analysis. And uh, something remarkable happened. Within 24 hours of its release, he'd assembled the genome, but within two days, someone else had assembled it to an existing lineage. Within five days, strain-specific diagnostic tests were uh, uh, were released, and within a week, over two dozen reports on the biology and evolution of the strain have been filed on an open source wiki. Just going into more detail here is that just a few hours after Nick had uh, assembled the genome, this guy here called uh, Mike Feldgarten, who he actually blogs on the name of Mike the Mad Biologist, and I have to say he does get into a very ranty mode at times, and I won't defend everything he's said in the public domain, but uh, he actually pointed out, well, actually, this strain isn't that novel. The Chinese had said, the BGI had said, oh, it's a novel strain. But in fact, he said, no, it's not. If you look and you do uh, a kind of virtual MLST on the strain, you can see that it is actually not novel, and it's related to a strain from Germany that had caused hemolytic uremic syndrome back in 2001. But then it really did become international after that. We had uh, people in the US, people in, in Britain, various people in Spain, uh, Hong Kong, China, Australia, all getting in on the action and contributing to the analyses. Uh, three particular people I'd like to name in, in detail there, David Studholm in, in Exeter, uh, Marina Manrique in Spain, and Kat Holt working on, in Australia, made particular efforts here in getting this stuff started, getting kick-starting the crowdsourcing analysis. David Studholm in particular uh, did some whole genome comparisons and pointed out that actually the most similar genome was from a, an E. coli uh, strain 55989, uh, and that, as we've heard, came from uh, patients with H a patient with HIV in the Central African Republic, uh, isolated in the late 1990s. 
but was from a, an, an, an interagrative lineage rather than from a traditional EHEC lineage. Uh, and Cat Holt, here's another example of the kind of work that went on. Cat Holt looked at the uh, aggregative adherence fimbri, uh, particularly the, the, the gene cluster encoding these in, in the genome, and said, oh, this is an unusual cluster. It has been described once before, but not seen in any of the genome sequence interactive lineages. So this was another interesting uh, feature of this genome that popped out very quickly within a few days of that assembly. And here is just, a, this is actually only a, a part of the uh, uh, list of analyses that went on over those days following uh, Nick's posting of the assembly on the 2nd of June. Um, and this actually continued through into July. Um, and you probably can't read it, but the names just give you a flavour of the international uh, nature of this work. Uh, German names, Spanish names, uh, Muslim names, uh, English names, all sorts, uh, uh, Polish names, all sorts of people getting involved. This obviously caught the attention of the, the news media and scientific media as well. Uh, uh, Nature blogged on it. Uh, Science actually mentioned this in, the, in press, actually in the printed version. Um, but it, it's worth pointing out, of course, that while we were doing this, there were other genome sequencing projects going on, as we've heard. Uh, and in fact, uh, it's worth just stressing that it was the, the guys here in Göttingen who got first to publication. They published a paper on the 29th of June, um, then a paper from Munster on, on July the 20th in PLOS One. There's been a bit of argument about, you know, who did what first. I come from the land of Monty Python. I'm not going to get involved in those arguments. If you like arguments, I would uh, suggest you go and look at this sketch here. It's an excellent sketch, the Argument Clinic, uh, where they talk about you know, the, the possibility of a five-minute argument or a full half-hour argument. As I've only got half an hour to give the talk, we can't even have a one-minute argument about who got there first. Key point is that there were four genome efforts, and all of them led to publications, peer-reviewed publications, which I think is the remarkable thing. How did we get to that? Well, when Nick Lohman pointed out to me all this was going on, uh, I said, well, a few tweets and blog posts do not equate to a peer-reviewed research publication. And particularly in the UK, we are driven to create high-impact peer-reviewed uh, research publications because we have this thing called the Research Excellence Framework. And so I said, this is all just piffle. He said, you're a grumpy old man, get real, get excited. I said, all right, well, what we'll do is we'll contact the, the Germans and the Chinese, and so we did, and we got involved in writing up a paper for the New England Journal of Medicine, which included a case study of a family from the outbreak, and I stressed that we should include, not just call it a, a genome paper, make it a genome paper, but we should also describe this crowdsourcing and the fact that this had happened in the public domain. Um, having done that, though, we then had to have some quality control, so we... Nick Lohman actually did repeat all the analyses, confirm everything in-house. We had some problems as to what to do about authorship. Um, at, by sort of July time, there were probably about two dozen people who had been involved in the crowdsourcing one way or another. Um, and it was already an international collaboration with lots of names on. So I tried to negotiate a deal. We came up with a compromise that we would name the four people that we thought had made the biggest impact earliest with the crowdsourcing. Um, and we would name them not actually as authors, but as part of a consortium. Uh, and, and that consortium would be named as among the authors, and then they would be listed in, the, in more detail uh, online. So our paper was published uh, on July 27th, back to back, uh, with Dave Rasco's uh, et al.'s paper uh, using the PAC bio system. And in fact, in the last uh, few days before publication, we got to, to speak to those guys a lot by email, and we, we were sharing the excitement of this coming out. One good thing that did happen, uh, as I say, I, tr I wanted really to have uh, the, the, the people named actually in the paper, but we ended up not being able to do that. We named them as just uh, this crowdsourcing consortium. But an excellent feature in PubMed, which appeared when the paper was actually published on, in the paper version, suddenly their names appeared as these four collaborators. So I was very pleased with that because uh, we, it was nice to see them actually named in the public domain like that and, and recognised. So, what are the takeaway messages from all this? Well, Germany is one of the most advanced societies on the planet. 
infection still presents a threat here. So that's something we can take to the funding bodies and to people that run medical schools and so forth to say, you know, don't spend all your money on cancer and diabetes and old age. Infection is still a problem. Pathogens don't bother with passports. As we say, it's not a new strain, something similar seen in Germany 10 years before, but there was also a similar strain, which hasn't yet been genome sequenced, but apparently is similar, that was seen in Korea uh, a few years ago. And the closest genome sequence strain, as we said, came from the Central African Republic and belongs to this interagative lineage. So how on earth do these things all relate? How, how are these strains getting around? One point that was noted earlier is that this is probably not a zoonotic uh, outbreak, it prob probably, because it's an interactive lineage, is generally circulate among humans, it's thought. There is some little bit of evidence that they come from animals. But this contrasts with traditional EHEC 0157, where there is pretty much always some cow shit in the background there. Either it's, it, people are eating cow meat that's contaminated with the gastrointestinal content, or uh, vegetables have got contaminated in the field and so forth. Here, this... Uh, the, the evidence of where this uh, strain came from, which lineage it belonged to, perhaps uh, pointed in a, to a different source. Bacteria evolve very quickly, and we've had a little bit of discussion of that already, lots of virulence factors jumping around. And there's a, a, another one of these arguments out there as to calling lineages by certain names and defining them in certain ways. I think this outbreak taught us that we shouldn't be quite so compartmentalized and rigid in our thinking. We have to accept that these different pathotypes may overlap, they may evolve over time and so forth. Uh, here's a list, uh, our, our list of the various uh, differences between uh, our strain and uh, the uh, 55989, uh, these plasmids uh, and various regions of difference. Uh, a worrying sign was that there was antibiotic resistance in this strain, including extended uh, spectrum beta-lactamase, when there was no antibiotics being used, it wasn't being selected, there was no obvious way in which it was being selected for uh, in, in advance of the outbreak. Um, uh, and in fact, normally with, with uh, hemolytic uremic syndrome, you do not give antibiotics because it, it's thought that these will actually make the condition worse. So there's just a bit of a worry there that antibiotic resistance is becoming so pervasive that it's popping up even in places like this. Uh, here's just a, a map uh, showing the comparison. I think uh, probably won't dwell on that. Um, so what about the effect on science in general? Have we created a new Weltanschauung, a new zeitgeist? Is this the way of the future, open source genomics? We, we, we coined this term open source genomics uh, to describe this propitious confluence of the high throughput genomics, very speedy sequencing, a crowdsourced uh, approach to analyses, and a very liberal approach to data release in the first place, and then Subsequently, when everyone did an analysis, they put it into the public domain. Uh, it's clear from this that social media like blogging and Twitter, despite me being a grumpy old man and condemning them, they do actually add to uh, the usual channels of academic discourse. And in the future, science won't just be done in the journals uh, and in books. It will be done through blogging and Twitter and so forth. Uh, and that's an important takeaway message. It is worth pointing out, though, we weren't the first. I mean, there are actually now quite a few crowdsourced uh, scientific uh, research projects, yeah, starting off with the search for extraterrestrial intelligence and all sorts of other things. And if you're interested, I particularly urge you to Google Jennifer Gardy TEDx, because she gave a talk last year uh, on what she called Public Health 2.0, where she spoke about very similar kinds of approaches applied to pandemic flu with early data release, genome sequencing, and so forth, and a very collaborative nature of the interactions uh, between international researchers. Have we broken the model? Are we actually changing things by example here? Uh, I think, uh, yes, in future, when we have public health emergencies, there will be this presumption that data goes into the public domain very quickly, and that people share it, and they, and they talk about it in a very free and easy way. I suspect ordinary science won't go on like that, that people will still keep their lab notebooks secret until they're ready to publish, and that uh, that may not change. Some people have described uh, this dilemma of the site or site dilemma. Do you put stuff into the blogs and say, oh, I'm working on this, I've got these ideas, uh, and invite people to comment on them and help you uh, fine tune your ideas, or do you go the traditional route and wait until you have a peer review publication uh, that's gonna get you those citations? 
This guy here, Inglefinger, was a previous editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and he's responsible for what's called the Inglefinger Rule, which says that the New England Journal of Medicine will not publish anything that's been published somewhere else before. And there was a lot of discussion. How, you know, had we broken Inglefinger's rule by putting all this stuff in the public domain and then trying to publish it as a paper? Well, New England Journal accepted it as a paper. They accepted our description of the crowdsourcing and our citations of it. Um, so perhaps we're, there is some change going on here uh, in that regard. Genome sequencing as a methodology, it's worth stressing that it does bring um, some advantages over other methods. So you can do a whole battery of PCRs looking for genes that you know about or suspect to be important. But genome sequencing brings this open-endedness. You don't know what you're going to find in the genome. Um, and uh, you can go in with an open mind. It's universally applicable. So you, if you want to do MLST, you have to work out an MLST for E. coli, another one for Staph aureus, another one for some other organism. Genome sequencing is one size fits all. As soon as you make the DNA, you can sequence it. And it provides the ultimate in resolution. And as we've heard earlier in the, in the um, uh, conference, we've, we, there are a number of benchtop sequencing platforms now which are going to be able to generate data quickly enough and cheaply enough to have an impact on real-world clinical and epidemiological problems. So this sequencing is going to become a distributed activity. It's not going to be just in big sequencing centers far away from hospitals or whatever. It's going to be coming closer and closer to the research bench and to, uh, to the ward. So, uh, next time these bacteria pop their heads up, I think the wisdom of the crowd may well triumph over the mutability of the microbial masses. They are wily, they're evolving all the time, but we're getting smarter and we're getting more connected. A couple of taglines there, knowledge is power, from uh, the English scientist Francis Baker, uh, Bacon, and uh, their Forsbundug Technik, which is known to all of you, of course. Um, and here is uh, some, some pictures of us uh, in, in Hamburg celebrating uh, with our uh, collaborators there. Um, and also we celebrated, had some champagne with Dave Rasco uh, the week before last when he was in Birmingham to celebrate our joint papers in the New England Journal of Medicine. I'd like to leave though with a thought about internationalism and the international nature of science that goes, goes back to Birmingham uh, back in, in the 18th century. There was a group of people called the Lunar Society of Birmingham. There was uh, prominent scientists, industrialists, entrepreneurs, and uh, they captured the zeitgeist of the time. They were talking about all the exciting appliance of science and the appliance of industry to human benefit. And this is Joseph Priestley, who was one of the members of that uh, Lunar Society, uh, pointing out that it was that common love of science that kept them all together and bound them all together. That's me finished. I just uh, put up an acknowledgement slide to acknowledge uh, the BGI, the guys in Hamburg, the crowdsourcing consortium, BBSRC that funded Nick Lohman, uh, Bet Fimister and the New England Journal of Medicine for being very gracious and helpful in, in seeing our publication through. And if you're interested in what we do, uh, you can go and visit our website xspace.ac.uk uh, or you can look at our blog or you can follow us on Twitter. That's me finished. Thank you very much. Other questions? Very inspiring, by the way. Thank you. Okay, fine. Um, so, so how do you, I mean, crowdsourcing is interesting, it's an interesting concept because you can recruit scientists in a very short term um, notice. Um, but how do you sell this to uh, funding bodies, for instance? So do you, how, do you, how do you explain to them that you can keep the same standards that they would demand and make sure through? peer reviewing of yeah. the project beforehand? Well, it is difficult. I mean, one of the things we've done over the last few years is we've maintained a site of X-Space, which is a site to allow people to use genome data meant for our bacteriologists. And it's an uphill struggle to get this resource to maintain those kind of things. Um, the, the thing about crowdsourcing as well is that there's a certain degree of unpredictability about it. You don't know who's going to show up and start helping you. Um, it, most of these people that were doing this were not public health microbiologists. They weren't professionally employed to do this kind of thing, but they had the skills to make use of the genomic data. And it was really nice that they actually kept in and that people actually made a, uh, this, this effort. But you're right, it's a very, it, it, this is a trouble. We're moving to this 
kind of unpredictable future where um, there are many advantages in, in, in just going out there and letting it all pan out. But those who like to count the beans and count the money and distribute the money may, may have problems with it. Well, I did cross swords on Twitter with the head of the BBSC because he said, you know, wasn't it great that his institute, he'd invested in his sequencing institute and they contributed to crowdsourcing. And I replied, well, you don't need an institute when you've got crowdsourcing, that's the whole point. <laughs> yeah. But you're also a bit of enthusiasm, and that's something that, that could easily pain of you with a second or third or fourth outbreak in a row. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be very interesting to, to see how many of you can recruit yeah. and yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, 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 that when, when, you know, if, if flu comes back or we get out of SARS or something, then I think yeah. then the people will, will turn to the crowdsourcing. If, right. if you said, oh, I've got an MRSA outbreak in a ward that's affecting a few dozen people, then I guess you'd have much more difficulty yeah. and you wouldn't get the same response. Um, but yeah, this is a, the, the point is how, you know, how, how can you, you know, it's just that, look, Controlling academics is like this is like herding cats. Uh, and you know, how can you bring all of these people together and actually get them to come to a useful outcome? And we were very, really delighted to you know, see this through to a paper. Yeah. Um, and, and it didn't just stay as this stuff on the box. But I mean, it's a, it could be a promising paradigm for that saying you know, research into third world outbreaks uh, exactly. where there's, there's less money available, whereas it doesn't have a higher I mean, it, one of the, the, the interesting thing is what actually sets things alive. We, you know, there being a, a community annotation project where the community hasn't bothered to show up, nobody's really contributed. Something like Wikipedia is remarkable. Wikipedia has been built by all these volunteers around the world, um, and it's become an amazing thing. And so, quite how you can predict which project will catch light and which one will fade it is difficult.